Hi, Vic Veer here, ENT surgeon. In this video, I want to tell you about the different types of hearing tests that you can get. So the idea is that if you see your hearing test and you wait and see the doctor, this will give you a little bit of information of what could be the problem. So this first chart that I want to show you shows a person who's got quite good hearing at the low pitched end. But as the pitch goes up and the, uh, the frequency goes higher or the pitch goes higher, so the E end of the scale, they can't hear it quite as well. And so sort of diagram, we call it a ski slope, but the, the hearing drops off at the higher frequencies. And we this is the most common type of hearing loss, which is age-related hearing loss. As one gets older, the hearing seems to drop in the higher frequencies and slowly with time, it gets deeper and deeper. And even the lower pitch noises start becoming affected. So this is what you'd see when you get older and your ears start, as it were, wearing out. And the first sign you would notice if you had this is that you'd have problems in background noise. So for example, if you're at a pub or if you're in a meeting, lots of people are talking at the same time and the person in front of you is trying to talk to you, you seem to hear them talking, but you also hear everyone else talking and the clarity has gone. You could, if you were in a solitary room with that person, they were talking to you, you'd be able to hear them fine. But it's with all the other noises going on around you it makes it quite difficult for you to pick out the clarity of the person in front of you. Often people are given hearing aids uh, at this situation. Now it is hard for a hearing aid to be able to help you with this sort of hearing loss at this level. If you're only having problems in a situation where there's lots of background noise and you can't hear the person in front of you, remember normally the hearing aids can only increase the volume. They don't really increase the clarity. Our brains have got fantastic ability of picking out noises and being able to focus in on them. But hearing aids obviously don't do that. They, they just increase the volume pretty much for everything. Uh, the software has got more sophisticated and things have got better. Two hearing aids do help in, in terms of increasing the clarity, even in background noise. But actually, I think it's different for different people out there. So some people are quite happy not being able to hear in that situation. They live, say, shall we say, relatively solitary lives. They don't need to hear in the, in the midst of background noise. They may have that problem, but it doesn't bother them in terms of their lifestyle. Whereas some people may be constantly in meetings and they're missing things out in their meetings and, or they're in a social event and they're just sort of laughing when everyone else is laughing, but they didn't really catch the joke and it's embarrassing for them and they don't want to give themselves away. So in these situations, maybe having some hearing aids might help them in that situation where they're trying to get clarity in amongst background noise. As things get slightly worse, it becomes harder to hear the person in front of you, even in a relatively quiet room. Uh, the TV seems to be going slowly up and up and then the neighbors start banging on the walls and saying, well, you know, why is the TV so loud? Put it down a little bit. Uh, and you do get to the point where, like say your grandparents and, and you say, oh, can, can you pass me the salt or, or how was your day today or something like that? And they can't hear you. And then you go really close and you, you say it again, they still can't hear. Then you end up shouting just so they can, you can be heard. And they go, oh, why are you shouting? <laughs> and it's this weird situation. Uh, the way I describe that, or the way I like to think of it, should I say, is that I don't think of hearing as the volume slowly dropping down in the upper frequencies, which is what these hearing tests seem to show. I sort of see it as a, like a piano key. Uh, a, a piano set. So you're pressing the keys on the piano when you're hearing noise. And at the upper frequencies, instead of the, you have to press a little bit harder to hear a single key, what you're actually getting is occasionally you're losing one or two of these keys and they're not working quite as well anymore. And in order to be able to hear that noise, what you do is you press it harder. And in some cases you can hear it, but sometimes the key is just dead. It just doesn't work anymore. So instead of using the finger to press that key, you're slamming your fist down on the keyboard to try and get some sort of sound and you end up recruiting some of the noises or the uh, sounds around it. And when you do that, you suddenly get it quite loud and, uh, it's, and it starts hurting them. So the, um, the window of being able to hear is quite narrow. So if you shout at them, obviously it's gonna hurt and it becomes painfully loud. But if you don't shout enough, then it's too quiet for them to hear. So it's a difficult situation that, and you have to tune your hearing aids just right to be able to get into that window so people can hear in certain situations. If you want a simple rule or a rule of thumb to work out whether or not you should get hearing aids, then a lot of people feel that if at 
two kilohertz, uh, this I'll point it out in the diagram, if at two kilohertz, your hearing drops down to below 30 decibels, you may well benefit from using hearing aids, and it's a good time to get it at that point. So this next chart I'm going to show you looks a little bit like the ski slope I showed you before, but it goes down just like a ski slope with the high frequencies, uh, less ability to hear. But then right at this point here, about four to six kilohertz, it comes back up again. So it looks like a reverse tick. Um, and you see that in people who have had acoustic trauma or noise exposure that's damaged their ears. Now, it's weird with uh, the ears. If you blast a low pitch noise into someone's ears, intuitively you think, well, all the low pitch noises, uh, the hair cells in your ear would be damaged and therefore you can't hear low pitch noises anymore. It doesn't really work that way. The interesting thing is that no matter what pitch uh, you blast noise into someone's ear, if it's loud enough to cause damage, it, what it actually does is damage around about four to six kilohertz, presumably because those are the most sensitive cells to being damaged. The sorts of people who get this problem, factory workers or uh, drummers, musicians, a lot of musicians have this sort of hearing loss. And more commonly now, you see people who've been wearing uh, earphones or headphones for a very long time, and they're blasting music into their ears. Now, this is the reverse ski slope, or you know, the exact reverse of the ski slope, because now the high pitch noises you can hear fine, but the lower pitch noises you can't hear so well. So it's like a reverse. Uh, and you see that in people who have had gentamicin and otomize and things like that. If you've had those drops for more than two or three weeks, there are situations where that can cause damage to your hearing. So there's also chemotherapy drugs that can cause this. And there are some conditions, you know, many airs disease can cause hearing loss in the lower frequencies rather than the higher frequencies. Now, this chart shows what we would call a cookie bite. It's uh, instead of a straight line at the top, there's a dip in the hearing in the middle. It seems very unusual. It's not high frequency or low frequency. It's in the middle. And you really seem to see that often in the people who have always had hearing loss. It's a, what we call a congenital hearing loss, something that they were born with. And strangely enough, these people have managed to get round it. They're, they've, they're, throughout their childhood, they had some problems, and if they looked back, they would notice that there was a problem. But they didn't really bother them that much. They sort of got through it. Somehow the child's brain has managed to get around this problem, not being able to hear very well in these middle frequencies. Those are the frequencies you can hear speech at. Their brains have somehow managed to work their way around it so that they don't have this problem and they can get on with life. And it tends to be later on in life when they're in meetings and everyone's talking at the same time and they've lost a little bit of the high frequencies. And so they start to come and say, oh, look, I've got a bit of tinnitus. I can't hear quite as well. What's the problem? And then you see this huge dip in their hearing. Did you not know this was happening? And often they, they didn't realize at all. Now, if you look at the hearing test now, it looks a little bit more complex and you might see this in all of your hearing tests. And what you'll see now is little triangles or weird sort of brackets. What that shows you is not just the noise that's been delivered through the ear hole and how well you can hear noise through the air. What it's also doing is sort of vibrating on the actual bone. So you're bypassing the air and you're sort of vibrating the skull so you can hear. Now, the benefit of that is that if you've got a finger in your ear like this, you uh, can't hear very well because if you did this and someone tried to talk to you, you can't hear very well because we all know that doing this stops your hearing. But if you were to scratch the bone behind your ear, this mastoid area here, you would be able to hear it. Like if I scratch it, I can hear that. But if I put my finger in my ear and then scratch it at the same time, I would hear it louder. It's, it's an interesting thing, that um, brain, weird quirk of our brains. So what we're trying to do is saying, if your ear is plugged up because there's a bone broken or the, the eardrum's not working properly or there's an infection or some or earwax inside your ears, if you scratch like this, you should be able to hear it if the nerve is still working. And that's really important for us because as a surgeon, I can't do much about nerve damage and things like that. So far, I've only been talking about hearing aids and things like that. But at this situation where there seems to be a gap between what you can hear uh, through the air and what your, what your ear can actually hear if you scratched or, or you translated a sound through the bone this way, that means the nerve is still working, but the sound isn't getting to that nerve. 
And the way to get around that is to just get rid of the obstruction for sound to get there. So for example, if there's earwax, I just remove the earwax and the sound can get there again. And then suddenly the, the lower um, hearing threshold will go up to where the triangles and the other brackets and things are. So it's almost like this is what you can hear at this level here. And this is the potential of your hearing if we were to fix the obstruction that you have in there. And that's really useful because uh, this is what surgeons get excited about because you can see the obstruction, you go, look, I think I can fix that. And then you examine them, do a scan, whatever you need to do to find out why they can't hear and say, look, there's a blockage there somewhere. Maybe the bones are off or, or the eardrum isn't working or there's a foreign body in the ear. Let me sort that problem out and then your hearing should just come back. Now, there is a situation where that becomes a little bit more complicated because in this situation, on the chart here, you can see that the uh, hearing is all the way down here in the realms of profound hearing loss. They, they literally can't hear a thing, even if you screamed in their ear. But you can see that the triangles or the brackets, whatever you want to do, uh, is a little bit high. I think, wow, if I only manage to fix the hearing from down there all the way up to here, they should be able to use hearing aids and then everything will be all right. So they think it looks like a mixed hearing loss. They've got nerve damage as well as um, uh, like a blockage in their ears. But actually, although this happens in maybe slightly higher levels, it doesn't work very well in this level because if your hearing is that low, actually all you're picking up, all when you're pressing that button is you're feeling the vibrations uh, through your skull uh, of this noise that's been transmitted. So it's very hard, this test isn't great. Um, and although we like to think of it as an objective test, it's just you thinking, oh, was that a sound? Was it not a sound? Was it my ear clicking? Or was it some sort of bird outside and you're pressing this button? So it's not an, I don't think it's a real objective test. It's pretty accurate for a subjective test. Anyway, I think I'm getting quite complicated now, so I'll stop talking about all that. Hope that was helpful. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.